Hi, I'm Ben Furman. And I'm Nate Blyton. And this is Patch In, a show from SoundNotion.tv dedicated to the wonderful world of all things electroacoustic in music. Our guest this week, uh, month actually, is the wonderful Mark Snyder. But before we get to Mark, uh, we've got a couple of news items to take care of real quick. So, Nate. <laughs> so, first of all, I know you all know the amazing band Nine Inch Nails or NIN.com. You can check out their stuff now. Uh, there's some exciting news from them. They've got a new album out. But And uh, on this show, we talk about things computer and electronic and audio and different things. And in fact, compression is going to be a special topic this week. And so it's interesting that we've got this story that the new Nine Inch Nails album is released both as a regular pop kind of project, but also as a completely compression-free album. So you can, you can buy different versions of it. Uh, check out their website. You can, you can get all these different versions of hesitation marks, a digital download, different formats of CD or even vinyl, and coming with a digital download. So yeah, check that out. It should be, it should be pretty interesting. And uh, if you've ever heard uh, a regular pop project, a pop album, uh, and comparing it to a classical album, you might think, like, uh, compression kind of gets a bad name, <laughs> In <laughs> I feel. Because compression is a valuable tool, as I'll talk about later in the show. But uh, to make just even, like, a regular drum kit sound like a drum kit that you're used to using in a recording there'd be like a certain kind of compression on, on the snare drum in particular or on the drums as a whole. And it's interesting. I haven't actually heard this album. Ben's got a copy of it. And uh, I'm, I'm super jealous. <laughs> um, but I've been reading what other people have been saying online about it. And like the, the amount of compression that they're avoiding in this is even down to the drums, even down to the individual instruments and tracks. So you should really check it out. Comparing the two versions of this would give you a really good idea of what exactly compression sounds like in a rock project. So check it out. New album from Nine Inch Nails, Hesitation Marks. Yeah, like Nate said, I do have a copy of it. It's amazing. Uh, next up, Ableton is coming out with version 9.1 of Live. I am really excited for this because it includes two things that I have wanted for a long, long time in every DAW I have ever used. Multi-monitor support, and it has a faster rendering engine than previous versions. So no more sitting and waiting in real time while your entire project bounces, which can be fine if you have you know a two-minute piece, but if you're doing an entire album, it's a little annoying. Uh, that will come out later in this quarter and should be available automatically as a download if you're a registered user at Ableton.com. The beta is currently going on now. Um, I've downloaded it, and it does work fairly well on the Mac. Uh, PC, I haven't put it on yet, so can't really give a review of that yet. Yeah. So it should be interesting. We're all looking forward to that. I'm not as much of a Nova or a, uh, Ableton Live user myself, but this, something like this might get me into it. Uh, we got some other news, less on the software side, moving into hardware. Um, the company Novation has been releasing a bunch of different things in uh, software, synths, and hardware, and keyboards for a long time, starting with like the Novation Base Station back in the late 90s. And uh, they had a bunch of different rack things, but uh, they've, got, they've been having a good collaboration with Ableton Live, in fact, and, uh, for a while, and so they've been making different interfaces for them. The latest in... Uh, collaboration like that is their new Novation launch control. Uh, I wanted to use Dave as a prop, our uh, our person who's doing the video switching, Dave McDonald. Could you, Dave, could you show us a little bit of your rig? Hey, here we go. <laughs> this is the thing. And watch, uh, Nate. Nate wrote this sweet program that will interpret my uh, button presses on on this little doohickey. And uh, watch what happens when I press this button. What? <laughs> what? <laughs> What? Okay, that's enough so this playing. Is, this is the lovely thing about physical interfaces, where <laughs> Dave's got all these things he's got to do for our show. He's got to uh, choose which camera from each of us we're, we're going to let you see uh, this little SN bug in the bottom corner. Whether or not that is on, <laughs> that's a thing he can control with one of those buttons. Uh, so he's got this software program, and he, he, otherwise he would have to click around and do all these different changes, but he's got it all just at his fingertips with a control surface like this. So uh, 
his interface or his uh, control pad that he has. Dave, what's that one called? This is the launch pad. This is one of the low end ones. Yeah, so it, I mean that's a low end one, but it's pretty big. It's, it's got a lot it's of cheap. It's <laughs> like sixty yeah. or seventy bucks. Wow, it's really okay. I didn't realize it was that cheap. This new Novation launch control you can get uh, from lovely places like uh, for around a hundred bucks, and uh, unlike his or unlike the launch pad that Dave has, it also has some knobs and stuff. I actually have a prop here too, Dave. Uh-huh. Or, uh, <laughs> the nano and, control. Yeah, it's, this is made by Korg, but it's got a good combination of things. It's got sliders that you can move up and down, some buttons you can press, but also these knobs. Uh, and the Novation launch control has a mix between Dave's and mine, basically. It's got a bunch of knobs, a couple of buttons, but then also the big Ableton Live style buttons for queuing and triggering different uh, things to happen. So yeah, this is an exciting new launch control from Novation. It's around 100 bucks, and you can L- get cheap it. cheap toys. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, yeah, check it out. Well, and for those of you who are Macs or PD users, the Nano Control and the Launchpad are both very, very, very easy to interface with those programs. So I am hoping that the new launch controls will be just as easy to use. But next up, we have something that just happened yesterday. Uh, this was reported on Synthtopia that Personas has bought Notion, the third uh, of the three music notation programs is now owned by another company. So only Finale is still independent. Uh, Avid, of course, bought Sibelius a while ago, and we all know what happened with that, Pro Tools integration. Uh, Those of you who are Sound Notion fans might have seen uh, Dave interview the developers from Sibelius uh, a couple months ago. They are now over at Steinberg, makers of Cubase. That was, that was the original of, developers, I should say, yes. not the current. The, the, the original development team based in the UK. They now work for Steinberg, most of them. So, go, but, Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> Just trying to be clear. Pretend I'm not here. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Pretend I'm not here. Uh, but those guys are now working on a project for Steinberg, so I'm assuming we're going to be seeing uh, notation integration into Cubase at the next major release. Uh, and now Personas, which is based in the U.S., is doing the same thing with Notion, which was formerly in the U.K. So this will hopefully mean that for those of you who use Studio One, you're going to have a lot of uh, new options in terms of being able to do scores and edit things similar to what you currently can do in Pro Tools. Indeed. Yeah, so that's uh, that's what we've got for our news so far this week, or month, I guess, yeah. <laughs> Still so used to the other shows that are weekly. But anyhow, uh, let's let's move on. And uh, Mark Snyder, thank you so much for joining us uh, on the show. Thanks for having me. Yeah, um, so we asked you to come on the show because we know that you've got a, a pretty good reputation for doing all these things with different instruments and electronics and festivals and all these things. Can you tell us a little bit about what you do and what you got going on? Yeah. Uh, all right. What I have going on? Well, I teach electronic music and composition and theory and orchestration at the University of Mary Washington in Berksburg, Virginia. Um, before that, I taught recording at University of North Alabama and then also recording at Delta State University in Cleveland, Mississippi. Um, and then before that, I was getting my doctorate at University of Memphis where I started these electroacoustic festivals. So this year will actually be, this November will be my 10th. Um, oh. festival. It started as Imagine 2 in Memphis. I did three years there and then uh, I moved to Cleveland, Mississippi so we changed it to the Electroacoustic Juke Joint. Yeah. I did one year in Alabama and then this will be my second year here. No! My third no, year. Third. Sorry. Yeah. The third year at wow. University of Mary Washington. Yeah, Time flies, huh? <laughs> it does fly. So I just sent out the schedule. I've got to finish the tech schedule and then I'm kind of done except for uh, I like to do after-hours events after each concert, and one of them sort of fell through, so I need to make sure that I can get a new location that'll be okay, but also serves really fancy beer for the composers that come in. Very <laughs> That important. is always important. Exactly. Yeah, I figured it was a, it was, it was a good deal. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah. Now, on the subject of festivals, uh, you've done something in creating an electroacoustic music festival that most people only dream of. So can you tell us, uh, what are some of the challenges associated with setting up a festival? 
well, I mean, it really, the only challenge is if you're an intelligent person, you just don't do it. Um, <laughs> for me, it's just been, um, I don't know, challenges. I don't know. I mean, you really just need to do it. The first, the first ones I did, they were just, I did three nights. So a Thursday night, a Friday night, and a Saturday night. I didn't know what I was doing. I asked the faculty, I was a graduate student at the time. I asked the faculty, hey, would you mind playing on some of these? And they did. Memphis also had a lot more money at the time. So mm -hmm. when people would say, I'm coming and this is my performer, if the performer was a fairly big name performer, I would be like, hey, I've got a couple hundred bucks if you want to do a master class. So it really worked out smoothly, except um, I, I lived in Memphis and they have this, now I don't even remember the thing, but it's Kajik. Kajik's big, Church of God and Christ's big convention is then. And every hotel within a 75 mile radius of Memphis is booked. <laughs> so I had to go around and beg all the faculty to house faculty composers that were coming in. And my fellow students and I just housed the student composers that were coming in. I mean, it all worked out. I mean, I think Alan Strange drank all of Alan Rippey's whiskey. <laughs> he stayed with him. But I mean, other than that, I think uh, no feelings were hurt. Everything worked out pretty well. It's always well. a danger when composers get together. Exactly. Right. Yeah, yeah. yeah, watch the liquor cabinet. Yeah. The, um, but no, I mean, every year it's just been... The only difficulties happen where there's that 1% that uh, they just don't have their act together. They come in, they think they need a 45-minute sort of sound check. They don't realize it's a festival. Me being more from the rock world, I just always figured it was going to be a line test and go. Yeah. Um, so uh, that that's the only problem. And then, you know, if there are issues... I've definitely bumped people to other concerts to accommodate those issues. I try to be nice about it, but that's that's really it. Um, especially when you're in my position and you're an undergraduate institution and you're trying to make it so um, the people that come in that have graduate programs are impressed with your students. Because the other thing that I do that's solely my own and probably one of the least intelligent things I do is my undergraduate students are the tech directors for the festival. Yes. Uh, and right. so while people get scared, they do a great job, and they learn more than I could ever teach them in a classroom. So that works out for me pretty well, too. And, and by the end, you've got a line of people that have graduate programs handing cards to these kids. Hey, if you're interested in all in graduate school, I would love to talk to you about coming here, 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 here. So yeah. that's pretty nice, too. Man, what a what a wonderful way to put the students in touch with these opportunities and like just the experience of learning to run a festival. Like the things that you know and the things that you have to deal with doing all the things that you do. Like you didn't learn that in a class or anything, right? <laughs> no, no, no. There's no pedagogy of <laughs> right, electroacoustic right. festival. <laughs> so, right. but I mean, but that you're able to give some of that education to your students. That's that's an incredible thing. Oh, yeah, no, I mean, they love it. I, and they get really excited for it. They're probably more excited for it at this point than I am. <laughs> to me, I'm just <laughs> yeah, right. thinking, oh, can everything go well? Right, right. right. This is, well, it, people and having, travel from a long way away. They pay a lot of money. And so you really feel very committed to do a good job with their music. Yeah, I, I imagine. So I, oh, yeah. you mentioned that. You mentioned that you came from a rock world, and I, uh, I've known you as like a, a, <laughs> a accordion, a clarinet player, a laptop musician, and all these things. But I did, where, where did, how did you get to this place from the world of rock, or what does that mean to you? Oh, well, I mean, to me, it, well, to me, it all just made sort of sense. Uh, I started in high school. I played tuba, was sort of my legit instrument, and then yeah. I played uh, drum set. Uh, for playing rock because you may not know it and I've tried to force the issue but tuba doesn't always work as well in rock and roll is one <laughs> might think although I did play sure. I played tuba in a couple of bands things like that too but that must have been interesting yeah, yeah. it was well I mean there was a band there was an old country band called Dirt Ball I played tuba in cool and Wes is still part of that scene he still does all the our front man still does all the artwork uh, for the drive by truckers and then uh, uh, another band called One Ring Zero uh, still does, they're still playing in New York. And so when I can see them, either they're on tour, I'll play tuba with them, or I'll go up there and, and play tuba with them on shows 
uh, that sort of worked out, but it's, I wouldn't call it rock. If that makes any sense. Uh, it's hard to know what to call some of that stuff. You know, it's like, it's not, it's not art classical, but it is art, you know, yeah. at least. Well, I hear yeah. post rock all the time nowadays. There That's you a, go. Potential yeah, exactly. Term. Or is, is, could there, could rock. you imagine a more pretentious expression than post rock? <laughs> like, we're so past rock. We're post I mean, <laughs> that thing. <laughs> but we're post not quite rock? together yeah, right. enough to know what to call ourselves. Right. Exactly. Mm-hmm. I like. I I never know what to call anything. Now I just did. Um, Andy Cole interviewed me for this uh, for his dissertation about mainly about sort of the tenure track sort of format and you know what do I do with my music uh, you know do I hold back on it do I go full force how does that sort of affect things and um, what did he say he said he was talking to somebody and he's like yeah you know Mark Snyder's like the cutting edge of that new sort of like simplistic movement it's like ooh <laughs> don't really want that <laughs> don't really want to be known as the cutting edge of the the simpleton or simplistic movement so that that's pretty wild. Well, that does actually bring up a question of mine. Um, obviously, you're involved quite a bit as a teacher. You host a festival. You play in uh, Nature Boy Explorer, and you tour as a composer to other places for performances. Seamus, uh, your own private tours. Um, how do you balance all of that together? Um. I, well, I, I try, at least with Nature Boy, well, there's there's three, right now I have, besides, I'm a teacher, and then I have three groups that I'm in. Mm-hmm. Uh, one is Intrepid Trio, we just finished a record for that. It's sort of like klezmer funk rock. And I play drums, and I write a lot of the tunes for that, and it's oh. fun, uh, but we probably, you know, we'll do sporadic shows. Uh, and it's drums, bass, guitar, and tenor sax. Yeah. Then Nature Boy and John, sorry, John, who's the guitarist for Intrepid Trio, does the booking. It was very painful, but it was his first time. I, he produced it, and we did it at a studio down in Richmond, and he did, a, he did a really good job. He'd never done anything like that before. And my God, if my first record sounded like that when I was 22, I'd be pretty happy. Go on. Um, so, and then I do the same thing with Nature Boy, which is harp and accordion, and then I play guitar and sing. But Paige and Becky, two of the girls in the band, are also writing more songs and are doing more of the booking. So what I can do is they start to sort of manage these so that I don't have to. And then I still try and manage and take control of all the Mark Snyder stuff, which is the tuba, the clarinet, the accordion, and the videos going on. Um, The only thing I struggle with sometimes is being able to shift from writing one style into another. That's really my only problem that I have. I had a good buddy... Uh, in New York, there was a painter, but when he was living in Richmond, he did a lot of portrait work. Because I mean, those you know, those wealthy families on Monument Avenue <laughs> pay a lot of money for him to to do a painting of the family or the dog or I don't know somebody's wife naked on a horse or something. I don't know. Sure. <laughs> but <laughs> it was hard for him to transition back into doing paintings that he would see as art. Um, and I see that. I mean, it's really. Uh, I guess I should let go of it, but I still segregate so much of my musical material. Because it, it's the same thing like Nate was asking about, how did you collect, go from rock to this? But, you know, I separated that tuba life and that drum set life. And I can remember the first time I went in to play with the band, and I think it was just a polka band or something like that. And I said, well, where's the music? And they're like, oh, well, you know, just play the chords. I'm like, well, no, I, I need music. I'm a classical <laughs> musician. I just played with you the other night. You were playing drums. You didn't need music for that. And it made me go, well, yeah, I, I guess I didn't need music for that. And so it's those sort of things. Yeah. I, maybe one day I'll be more comfortable. I think definitely on the classical side, I've let a lot of sort of the ambient and more pop elements into that. Mm-hmm. It would be nice if I could start letting some of my more experimental stuff into sort of my pop rock. Yeah, that, yeah. that'd be interesting. And like that that world of uh, really digging into the art stuff, really digging into the different kinds of textures in pop music, that's the stuff that I really, if, <laughs> like, don't tell all my classical music friends, but that's the stuff I really like. <laughs> <You know>? Yeah. <laughs> so, well, and that was the focus of the Seamus conference. Uh, yeah. 
back in April, actually. Uh, you had so many pop classical hybrid pieces there. It was wonderful. Yeah. Man, so I, there was another thing I wanted to touch on, actually. You mentioned that uh, in your band with uh, guitar vocals, accordion, and harp, maybe it was in that or maybe it's in a different project, but you do some video projection as well. Yes. Well, Is no, actually, right? I just do the video projection with the, the, um, the classical stuff. I, oh, okay. I think I made some sort of video years ago. Um, well, I also have a Cocteau Twins video band, a Cocteau Twins cover band that I did. <laughs> we did some sort of video stuff as sort of the backdrop. Because awesome. I've done video to be, nice. when people didn't have money for sets, I've done video for, like, so they'd use the video that I would make for a set. Yeah. So, I mean, bringing video into a venue, that's a whole different thing to arrange like it's a whole different layer you don't need like chairs music stands or stand lights and your instruments but like projector <laughs> projector cables and all these things how how yeah. like what what's it like <laughs> bringing that to different venues or, or yeah oh uh, we'll see well that's been my well that, and that's the interesting thing about doing it as a classical project is right uh you know, people trying to throw their cigarette butts and their beer bottles in your tuba when you're playing. I mean, it can get pretty interesting. Um, but the video thing hasn't been that bad. I generally put the projector on top of the, the worst, like this, not the worst, because actually it was the, one of the best shows I've ever done. There was this little coffee shop in Memphis. And I set up and I had a sheet that I hung on like the side of a wall. And then I put the projector down and my sound, my big fat electroacoustic sound i had to 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 sum it to mono and send it through a guitar amp mm. which oh, was not okay. obviously how i wanted everything to be presented <laughs> but right. it was like this sort of lo-fi intimate version and of course i was really uptight about it at the time even like maybe a week afterwards but i sold 35 cds at that show cool. i mean people loved it because the other thing i do is i i don't write my program notes down i talk about the pieces and I, so I, when I'm doing a show, I tell you about what's going on. And so it really seemed to connect. And I guess because it wasn't so crazy over the top and it looked like a small television instead of a massive screen of video behind me, right. it was a, I don't know, for the people that were at the coffee shop, it was a much more pleasurable experience. Yeah. Um, so I guess you just... And I think even when I did Metro Scene, I mean, I just put a... Didn't I just put something up and I just showed it on a piece of wall? Uh, yeah, we just put up uh, the projector and, yeah, I think we just used the wall for that. Yeah, I mean, I just carry a projector with me. I mean, it's really not a big... Unless the place has so much light, mm -hmm. which that coffee shop had a light, a lot of light as well, too. It really... I find that if I'm comfortable with it, the audience is comfortable with it, and they just go with it, and they just enjoy it. It's um, it, Everything I've figured out relies more on the audience than it does on me or anything else I'm doing. Well, that's, if, some, if, if they're intent and they're like into it, it's a great show. Now, on that's that it. subject, um, some of the stuff that you do gets pretty wild. I mean, I've seen you perform uh, Harvey and Butterfly and Pornography. And some of the video stuff there uh, with all the jitter use is really, really wild. So how do you think uh, that the audience connect to that? Are they connecting to the video, to the music, or to some combination thereof? Well, I mean, I think each person is different. Um, mm -hmm. I know how I want them to connect to it, which is sort of my philosophy, which is, you know, the video is just an extension of the orchestration. It's just mm -hmm. another part of the piece um, that to me is as integral as anything else. But, um, you know, I eventually released a CD of stuff going, oh, well, this is not how I want it to be done. But then I just got over myself and said, you know what, people just need to consume what I make in their own way instead of me dictating how it should be consumed. I mean, yeah. it took a lot to get over that because I think, you know, we spend months on these stupid pieces and then the next thing you know is like, no. You can't listen to it like that. It has to have the video. It has to have a subwoofer. And it has to have four channels. And it has to have all this. Well, you know what? Some people are going to like it without that. And I would rather them get use out of it than me holding it back because of one element that I feel needs to be there. Right. Uh, I mean, I do feel that my classical stuff, without the video, you're really missing a lot of what I'm trying to portray. But at the same time, I mean, a lot of people still get it without the video. 
Okay. That's a really interesting thing. Like, uh, so on, on the show, we're all composers. I know Ben and I in particular have done, we've done works with either electro electronic or acoustic stuff with video and, and different things. And it's, I know for myself, it's been a really interesting process, just figuring out the relationship between the music and the video and, uh, on two levels of figuring out, like, I, I like it that you talk about it as an extension of the orchestration. That's a really interesting way to put it. Um, I, I'd be curious a little bit about your process of what it's like orchestrating with video and maybe even, like, if you're willing to <laughs> reveal some of your secrets of technically how you go about just your process of, do you have music and then you have some images that you put to it or what, what's that relationship like? Well, I mean, like, well, but see, that's just the, the the question is interesting because it's like, well, hey, so for all of your pieces, you use these pitches, right? Well, no, yeah. sometimes <laughs> no. I use these pitches. So I guess <laughs> it, the difference comes from, uh, all right, so I was, I did a piece for a, a, a Michigan State grad, Andrea Cheesman. Uh, yes, excellent, excellent for, clarinetist. Yeah, and oh. it was... Um, her mom's a painter. So I just got her for a whole summer to take pictures. They were supposed to be higher resolution than they were, but they were, they, they, they did fine. Uh, <laughs> but she took pictures of all the paintings and I used that for the video. Um, so I, I melded them together. I do a lot of subtractive compositing. So you're sucking color from the image behind it or whatever. So it makes this really nice blend. And then I try to squeeze them and stretch them and turn them into different colors. So that's what I did for that. Um, and it was called messy because that's what Andrea used to call her mom's paintings when she was a little kid. Uh, then for the, uh, pornography piece, I went to the Prelinger archive and it was, I mean, it was a tone row of 12 pitches. Well, so I had video footage of 12 old fashioned strippers, you know, the kinds doing the feather dances, but I wanted tenure, so you really can't tell that that's what's happening. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, quick interjection for our viewers. The Perlinger Archive is part of uh, the Internet Archive. It's at archive.org, and they are a collection of video ephemera. So it can be anything from commercials to old strippers to uh, political ads to whatever you can possibly find. They might have it up there. It's awesome. And we yeah, should put a link really to that in the show notes. It really is for me. Yeah. And then uh, Harvey, I just used um, – Harvey, I just got my kids who at the time man, were five and three, six and four, yeah, uh, to just draw – to make drawings for me. And then I used those drawings for that. Um, and it was just part of the piece, just like for Harvey – you know, it's it's about a really terrible thing that happened in Richmond that involved kids, and so there's um, field recordings of playgrounds and things like that. So, I mean, it all to me, I'm very bonehead about things. Like, I mean, you know, when you think back about, okay, let's use some retrograde now. Let's use some let's 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 use some imitation. Let's use some, uh, you know, let's do an arch form. That's sort of how I am, but. All those connections are very bonehead as well. It's like this sound represents this. This picture represents this. I'm not. Um, I'm not trying to. I intellectualize it on a. I'm connecting all of these materials, but it shouldn't. It's never really something that's so. Oh, did you see how I did that? Okay. You know what I'm saying? It's not <laughs> right. right. Not the evil thing going on. Yeah. Now. Um, if this is not too personal to ask, uh, are you synesthetic? Am I, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm from the <laughs> South. I don't, I, we don't talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> Am I what? I have no idea what that means. Uh, synesthetic. Uh, synesthesia is a uh, condition where your brain processes things like sounds with an associated color or smell, or you might feel a texture on your tongue uh, whenever you hear a specific note. This is always something I like to ask people this who do a like lot of work with video. Okay, maybe I took acid at some point. <laughs> <laughs> but he didn't inhale. Yeah, pretty much so. It's more of a, a nurture. No, than I am not synesthetic. Okay. <laughs> I am not. 
Yeah, that's my obligatory <laughs> question for people who do video work. Oh, yeah. well, should I, I? Well, I'll go ahead and do this. <laughs> I don't always connect things that well, and and I guess I never really had one of the things I like most about the fact that I do videos is that I don't have that background, so it's still that sort of sixteen-year-old kid plugging stuff into pedals and experimenting the whole time. Mm -hmm. Right. And so I wasn't really thinking about it. And I was actually on a job interview. And so a video person was there and they were talking to me and they were saying things and they were like, oh, well, you know, that's like a whole Roy G. Biv kind of thing. And I was like, <laughs> I, I don't know who he is. <laughs> Roy G. Biv, which, of course, is the color spectrum. But I didn't know that at the time. So, oh, man. That's okay. great. So now I've learned yet another word. Thank you, Ben. Absolutely. Synesthetic. <laughs> good with no. I mean, so this is interesting to me because, like, I, I'm definitely a musician first, and just just toying with this uh, world of video and visuals is like really uncomfortable at times because I'm just like, I hope this looks okay. I don't know. <laughs> Am I breaking rules doing this? Is this is this oh, a my big first was horrible. I mean, no one yeah. has ever seen it except for my wife. And then Cameron, I, I was in my doctoral program at Memphis, and Cameron was who I studied with most of the time. But in the summer, he was in Turkey. So I studied with John Power. And John said, you know, let's just share this between each other. I don't think anyone else needs to see this. <laughs> <laughs> it was really, it was the most god-awful thing that I think any human being has ever made. Like, That's even funny. when I get bad videos submitted for the festivals or, like, if I'm judging for Seamus or something like that, I can go, you know what? This is not very good, but it's nowhere near as bad as my first video. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, I think because, we've all had videos like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, indeed. Um, because we have the resources and because we're trying to make this a, a technical podcast in contrast to the other ones that we make, I wanted to ask Dave to do me a favor. Since he made a comment before we started the show about your wonderful green back wall that we have. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> uh, and you mentioned the, the chroma key kind of using different color differencing as a technique. Uh, and uh, Dave, would you be willing to demonstrate a little bit of what that what that's like, sure. <laughs> if you don't mind <laughs> us right. using your video? What's behind me? It's a cat in a shark costume on a Roomba chasing a duckling. <laughs> <laughs> this is the this is the video I put up when we have technical difficulties. This is why there's okay. a technical difficulties okay. text there. So this for our viewers, this is a demonstration of that technique. He's uh, he, we can process the video looking within a certain color range and then remove that video and replace it with something else using all the colors in the frame that aren't that color as a mask on top of the other video. It's a pretty interesting thing. That's color keying. Yes. <laughs> Yay! Yeah. <laughs> that is a live demo that actually worked. I just want to point that out. It yeah, right? was not yeah. planned before the show started. <laughs> I'm doubling my own salary. Right, exactly. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Um, one question I have: uh, You are a professor, so in fact, <laughs> what are the challenges? I don't know if you knew that about yourself, <laughs> right? I did. So, what are the challenges that you uh, you find in teaching music technology nowadays? I mean, we've got a proliferation of uh, DAWs and environments. There's obviously Ableton, Pro Tools, uh, Cubase Studio One, Nuendo. You know, take your pick. Uh, there's also different programs out there for synthesis. Uh, there are different interactive environments, Max PD, Super Collider. Um, what do you think students need to know nowadays? Wow, what do I think students need to know? That's that's deep, baby. Uh, <laughs> well, I mean, I guess South. I can tell you what I do here. Mary Washington, and what to me is very special about it, because I get a lot of questions from people that want to come here, and they say, well, you know, you don't have a music composition or um, a music technology degree or any of these specific things. You just get a BA in music here. And what I like most about it is, first and foremost, uh, instead of having like a, a Bachelor of Music to me, 
you're getting all these other classes and other disciplines. Mm -hmm. And one of the greatest things about making art is if you have no inspiration to make art, then it doesn't really matter how well you know how to make it. And I think those classes really help you to sort of pull that in. So I like that side of it. But then specifically with, with the technology stuff, I think it really depends on where you're teaching. Um, you know, my electronic music class is filled with non-majors, so they don't even know how to play it sometimes. So we start out with a music concrete project and, and move from there. And it works out pretty well, but you're, it, it just depends. And so what happens is here, because you only need 40 credits in music for the major, you do independent research. And the great thing about that is they can get really focused. If they want to be, if they want to record this type of stuff, they do an independent project with me in that area. If they want to do electroacoustic stuff, like if they want to just do Max, they can do Max, but in their specialty areas. I mean, how many times did you sit through Max classes going, when are we getting to jitter? When are we getting to jitter? I just want to do jitter. <laughs> I, I got this whole audio side down. Get me to jitter. You know what I'm saying? And so I really mm -hmm. like that aspect of here. But as far as the DAW side goes, I, am, I thought when I came up from Alabama and Mississippi that had open enrollment, which were open enrollment schools, and what by that means anybody that applies really can get in to a um, selective liberal arts institution, that I would be able to be more like RPI and like Neil Rolnick. Uh, I looked mm -hmm. at his syllabus one okay. time, and basically he said, I'm teaching you to make art. You teach yourself the software. And that was really great. And they had to buy able, they had to buy an M Audio controller that had like Ableton Live Lite in it, and they had to create art with these tools. And he wasn't going to fool with the software. It wasn't his deal. Thanks to No Child Left Behind, and <laughs> thanks to uh, Virginia has something that's even worse, which is SOL, which is standard. What's on the learning. test? What's on the test? Exactly. And so, I mean, they really just, kids aren't prepared. For that at this point anymore. I mean, they really can't do it unless you give them a laundry list of things to do. Mm -hmm. So I teach Ableton. We have a MIDI course and we have, um, and if you want, you can look at the syllabus and all the readings that they have to do. It's midi.umwblogs.org. And there's a syllabus tab and you can listen to all the student projects. So the, the way it's structured is the first uh, third, almost half of the course is logic. And I basically spoon feed them. This is how you do this. This is how you do that. And we learn a little recording in the class as well. Mm -hmm. Then uh, the next is, okay, here's Ableton Live. This is how Live is very different from Logic, meaning I, I use Ableton Live in it, like for its namesake, which is this is really great with using Live stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and so, <clears throat> but from there... Here are all the techniques you learned in Logic. You will now learn them in Live. You teach yourself. So once I'm able to get them to teach themselves how to use it, they can teach themselves Pro Tools, they can teach themselves Studio One, whatever yeah. they want to do. So, I mean, it's that old adage of, hey, if I teach you to teach yourself how to do this, then you're going to be fine. And it, it's the same thing. Okay, for Logic, all of them end up defaulting to SF Logic Ninja because that's one of the ways you get an A. To get an A on a project, you have to do something we didn't go over in class. Document how you learned it and then go from there. And that's where the cool. finding a YouTube video in some sort of way throws that over the top. That's wonderful. Um, so, I mean, it's a, it's a philosophy that's still sort of in flux, but it's a philosophy that sort of works for me. And, I mean, I think that's the best way to do it. I mean, you just have to teach the software you're comfortable with and you have to teach it in a manner that you're comfortable with. Um, you know, I see all these people that don't use Pro Tools, you know, composers yeah. that are like, well, I've got to teach Pro Tools. It's in the industry standard. I'm like, yeah, but it's the industry standard is a tape machine. I mean, when you're talking about <laughs> record, play, edit, and then, you know, um, elastic audio, there's really not a whole lot different if you're looking at it from that standpoint as sort of a recording engineer standpoint. And I mean, I, I use personally, I do use pro tools to track cause I love tracking it. It's just, mm -hmm. especially oh, yeah. if nothing else, because it's yeah. the easiest thing to insert a marker in. Yes, <laughs> <you do. laughs> enter, enter it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, each of them have their strengths and you know, if I had the money to keep DP around, uh, cause the surround implementation for DP is just, is to me is the best. Mm. So they all have their strengths, but to me, for $199, these kids are not going to beat Logic. 
and I know it's not cross-platform, and I feel bad about that, but boy, I mean, all the instruments, all the sounds, all the effects, everything that you can do with it, right. you just can't beat it. And then live, I don't have, because we're a liberal arts school, and I have a MIDI class, an electronic music class, and I'm about to start a production class, those are my only three technology classes. So I need to get everything music technology done in three classes, right. meaning if you want to do Macs, you have to do an independent project. And I have one student now who uh, was awarded an undergraduate research grant. He's getting an iPad. He's getting uh, Keith McMillan Soft Step. And oh, yeah. um, what's the third? Oh, and a DSLR camera to document the whole thing on a blog. Awesome. Nice. Is that too much? Did I go too far? No, like no. This educational is educational oh, philosophy oh. on you guys. It's great stuff. I mean, you've touched on all the different platforms, different digital audio workstations, the DAWs. Like, I haven't, I've never used Digital Performer myself, so that's interesting to hear about it as valuable for the surround, uh, surround kind of works and things. And uh, yeah, Pro Tools, exactly. The <laughs> like, just there's some little little things that are just a little bit different, and that's where I, that's the thing that I find. Uh, is so interesting talking to composers about software is like that uh, there are different little things that make the creative process a little bit easier or just like just get used to something even if it's like a weird old version of cool edit pro you have on your nine, windows 98 machine or something like if that's what yeah. you really like <laughs> yeah. then maybe and like if that has the fewest blocks for your creative process then that's yeah. great and like it makes it a hard case to to tell them to learn logic to <laughs> or learn learn pro tools except for the just the amount of resources like i've been really impressed with what logic can do um just for the pile of synthesizers and and different yes. kind of effects that it has um coming from a background i grew up using a bunch of uh synthesizers rack gear and and different things and like just had i i loved taking pictures and setting up my whole rig downstairs but now it's all in my little laptop and in one program and then like MIDI isn't even really a thing I have to do or deal yeah. with and not, not nearly in the same way except to get notes in. It's like, oh, I know. Well, like the whole thing, oh my God. Well, see, I started Logic <laughs> with 4 where you had to okay. like build yeah. your freaking you studio. Everything. Oh my yeah, God, yeah. And it was a nightmare. Well, no, but it still took until Logic 10. I, I can't believe this year will be the first year I don't have to teach the environment. Because to put an arpeggiator into logic, you had to build it in the environment. It was yeah, insane. And people would be like, I don't understand this, Dr. Snyder. <laughs> like, <laughs> well, and that's why I always would teach reason for things like the arpeggiator device and just show them how to integrate that with Pro Tools or with Ableton. Yeah. yeah. Well, but now they're all MIDI effects, like they should be. Yeah. Now, I haven't tested it yet, but I'm hoping also that the, the, the sequencer doesn't need to be running for it to work. Because that was the other thing with Logic. The sequencer yes. needed to be running, and you had to build the stupid thing. And that was for the delay line. That was for the arpeggiator. Oy, 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 oy. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, but technology today, you know, it's uh, yeah, oh, I know how far we I mean, Think about having to go through the back of the manual and say, okay, Cutoff resonance is this control number. This is this, and you'd have to then program your control uh, surface for it. And it's like now, I'm just clicking it. Thank you very much. And then I've got the Novation. It's not the high. It's the one in the middle. So it's using the Auto Map sort of software. To yeah. Okay. Everything. Cool. Oh, it's very nice. Although okay. interestingly enough, it works best with Live and Pro Tools. <laughs> Right. <laughs> really? <laughs> well, I haven't really tried it with Logic 10 yet. Well, there was there was a problem. I had to do something to correct the problem, which I did, and then I just haven't had the opportunity to do it. Now, I went crazy for this new Nature Boy record. We went to – I let somebody else record it because cool. it was great because I learned so much stuff on that Intrepid recording that we went down there, and I, I knew that I couldn't control myself. I was going to want to play drums on it, and it was like this sort of folk thing, and we didn't. No bass, no drums, bass clarinet. For the yeah. bass. Nice. nice. <laughs> yeah. I'm kind of brilliant sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> sometimes I, know I don't know who Roy G. Biv is. <laughs> right. <laughs> Man. Oh, well, wow. well, Mark, thanks so much for uh, joining yeah. us and sharing all these things. It's really super valuable to talk to such a great composer. And you've got these experiences in so many different uh, 
veins and everything, and you've got all these projects going on. Do you have any anything in particular you'd like to plug uh, of a shows coming up or something like that? Well, of course, the the barn dance is November seventh through the ninth. I'll okay. be at Electronic Music Midwest two weeks before that in Kansas City, which cool. is very well organized Super Tech Festival. And then I get to be at third practice at University of Richmond the weekend before the barn dance. So I'll do three in a row. Oh, nice. Yeah. It's festival season, all right? <laughs> it is festival season. It's really hard that mine is last, too. Oh, yeah. Because that means I'm going, I'm going, oh, I have a festival to put on. <laughs> Let's scramble, get everything yeah. together, right? But it'll be fine. Just cool. a little goes a long way. Wonderful. Well, it, I, it's thanks again so much for coming on the show. This feels like a good place to wrap up. Um, yeah. yeah, so thanks again, Mark Snyder. You can check out Mark Snyder's stuff, MarkSnyder.com. It's, pretty, it's good, good, nice <laughs> web SEO kind of way to get your website named. Well, it's MarkSnyder.org, <laughs> actually. Org. Oh, dot .org, okay. I'm an organization or an organism. I haven't figured out which. Okay, okay. interesting. We, I, I had a different that's redirecting you. to yeah. MarkLSnyder.com. Yeah, well, I, but the L makes me sound pompous. So I don't want to sound pompous. Oh. <laughs> okay, well, fair enough. So that's gotcha. MarkSnyder.org, MarkLSnyder.com, or, or you can check out these festivals, and we'll, we'll have some notes or uh, notes about all of this in our show notes and stuff. And uh, But thanks again. Uh, this is another episode of Patch In. Don't, our, don't our, forget, yes. you gotta, oh, we gotta, hey, we've got Nate. more. Oh, oops. Yes, Nate, yeah. it's right. time. I'm trying it to get time. myself off the hook. Yeah, oops. no, you are not off the hook yet. Okay. Um, as part of our show, every episode we do a two-minute challenge where either Nate or I will explain some sort of technical thing about audio in two minutes or less. And it is Nate's turn to do this this month. So, Nate, what are you explaining in two minutes or less? So, as I mentioned earlier in the show... Uh, this episode, we've talked a little bit about compression with Nine Inch Nails, so I thought I'd give a rundown of just the basics of what audio compression is and why you need it, for why why it's useful. Well, obviously, you don't need it because, <laughs> yeah, as Nine Inch Nails has pointed out. All right, so, Dave, do we have a timer for this? There it is. Tell me when to go. All right, whenever you're ready, Nate. <laughs> All right, I, I'll uh, give a little disclaimer. I'm not quite as well prepared for this as Ben was last week. So here goes. <laughs> I want to demonstrate it. I can talk really close into the mic, and it's a certain level, or I can talk back here, and suddenly you can't hear me quite as well. In a live situation, uh, you might have dynamic differences like that in, in any kind of instrument, particularly in vocals or something. As I'm sitting there at a mixer board, I've got my, my level. I can control the level of the mic. And uh, if somebody's like all over the place with it, I can do what's called riding the fader. Like, oh, they're, they're really quiet. I'll put it up. Oh, they came back. I'll put it back down. There's a wonderful device and a process that you can use to automate this process. It's called compression. Uh, what you would do, and, uh, and there's basically like a, a couple different... Uh, <laughs> elements, different variables that you would use to control a compressor. You can, you can change how fast your little virtual hand on the fader would go up. That's the attack. <laughs> you can control how much you're going to turn it up when it, uh, when it detects that like it's too quiet, I need to turn it up. Or like, I guess that's expansion. What, uh, most of what compression does is it turns things down when they're too loud and then brings them back up when it decides <laughs> it's cool, we're quiet again. So, uh, and the attack is how, fat, how quickly it ducks it down, the release is how quickly it, or how much it, or the slope at which it comes back, and the ratio is uh, how much it ducks it down. The threshold is how loud it has to get before the compressor will, uh, compressor will be active. And that's basically it. Uh, you use a compressor, a compressor to uh, regulate levels in an audio signal, either in live or in a studio setting. And it can really change the sound of something, or it can make it appropriate for a CD, or it can just make it sound a little bit different, used as an artistic device. Compression. Nailed it. 
<laughs> Nailed it just in the nick of time. All right. I hope that I hope that made some sense and wasn't too fumbly. Uh, and uh, the thing I was going to mention in it is that this is different than other compression that you might have with this. No, you yeah. No, you're over it. No, no yeah, more. Exactly. No more explaining. <laughs> no, no. You're you're breaking the rules. We have rules. Whatever. Audio compression. There you go. Okay. No. Uh, level compression. Whatever. Next week, so data compression. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> so, as I was saying earlier, before I completely missed the thing that I fumbled up, thank you for joining us on this month's patch. In thanks so much, Mark Snyder, for joining us. I'm Nate Blyton. Ben Furman is I'm with ben us. Furman. <laughs> and uh, yeah, thanks again. Look forward to seeing you next time.